I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to Nano at Tech. Um, uh, this is our actually our last session for 2022. Um, we'll be starting up again in January. I think our first speaker is January 10th, so look out in your emails for the announcement for, for that speaker. Um, it's a real pleasure to have us do the wrap-up uh, session with us today, uh, Professor Stephen Ralph. Um, Stephen got his uh, bachelor's degree in electrical engineering here at Georgia Tech and then went on to Cornell uh, to get his PhD, did a postdoc at Bell Labs and was also a visiting scientist at IBM's um, TJ Watson uh, Research Center before coming to Georgia Tech where he is currently a professor in electrical and computer engineering, uh, is the Glenn Robinson Chair in Electro-Optics, uh, has an adjunct appointment at GTRI, and is the director of the Georgia Electronic Design Center, as you can see on the slide here. Um, he's also director of a, a new uh, NSF-funded IUCRC uh, called EPICA, um, and is a fellow of Optica, which is formerly the Optical Society of America, and a senior member of IEEE. And with that, I will turn it over to Stephen to talk about silicon photonics. Good. All right, thank you, David. Thanks, everyone, for coming here and anybody who may be uh, online virtually with us. Um, seems like a good, a good afternoon to be inside. So. Um, I'm going to try and cover my 144 slides in 45, 50 minutes or so, um, actually about 60. Um, much of my team is here, um, and thank you everyone else for coming. So I want to just kind of, um, I know the audience is varied, so no equations. I'll try to just give you some intuition about what we're doing and sort of the scope of, a little bit of the scope of where integrated photonics is today, and a touch at the end on some of our machine learning strategies for photonic systems. Let's see if this works. Good. So first, just to remind everyone that uh, we're a part of GEDC, which is an integral part of IEN. We're a center of IEN, uh, known as GEDC, and our mission is aligns uh, directly with the mission of IEN. And so we're, we're a, one of the larger centers that are part of IEN together with PRC, Packaging Research Center. Um, just to give you a quick idea of the, the scope of what GDC in general, GDC faculty are engaged in, just to, here, let me stand here. I think this is better. This is better. Um, that we are in, working at this uh, intersection of photonics, electronics, perhaps even MEMS, <clears throat> and digital signal processing, statistical processing, and machine learning. Uh, we're really looking at things from a systems perspective, although today I'm going to mostly focus on uh, components for integrated photonics. Um, here is much of my team. I um, always like to put my team up front. Um, often people talk at the very, very last slide, but without these folks, some of which have now graduated, none of this is possible. So thanks to them. Okay, so let's talk about integrated photonics. Uh, we're really familiar with, uh, hopefully, with electronics and the scale of microelectronics and VLSI. Uh, we're, hopefully, we're familiar with MOSFETs and how they work, and even the new structures, the wraparound gate structures that a number of companies are moving forward with, trying to beat Moore's Law. So we're familiar with those techniques. Um, but we should also be familiar with silicon waveguides, that is, de devices that guide light. And note this, the scale here that we're, we're already in the photonic space of, you know, submicron. But because light is a, the, we work with is usually of the order of one micron, that you would expect structures to be of that scale. Um, here's a simple interferometer, which is just a way of mixing two optical signals together and looking at their sum and difference, so to speak. Um, you can also go to photonic crystal cavities, where we use essentially um, in the interference uh, structures to create modes, fixed modes within a structure, within a cavity. Um, and then we also have, and this is what I'll talk about a lot today, or at least a good part of the talk, about these new design paradigms for designing integrated photonics in a way that really uses and leverages uh, a machine learning type approach. 
So what about uh, integrated photonics? It is the next big thing, not just in telecom, but it is just pure the next big thing. It is really coming on, and I'll explain why. A couple of things to look at here um, uh, that um, it is both challenging and growing, but it is growing faster than a lot of the other types of techniques, a lot of the other conventional, say, electronics and conventional telecommunications advances. Okay. Also, it's not new. I mean, a lot of times you hear in it's brand new. We're, at the, we're on the basement, we're at the gr ground level. This is a brand, it's not new. Um, these are some books, some of which I inherited from now retired faculty. Um, but as you can see, um, integrated photonics move forward, albeit at a separate pace, as the conventional microelectronics industry. So it's not a novel thing. What's novel, and I'll talk about more, is the ability to do things at scale through foundries. That's what's new. This, this text here, Hunsberger, uh, part of the Springer Verlog series, was extremely well known throughout the 80s and 90s. Okay, just a couple of metrics. When you work in photonics, you have to be able to work it on three different metrics, uh, frequency, wavelength, and energy. Energy, when you're working with the semiconductors and you're talking about band gaps. Uh, frequency, uh, when that's convenient, or wavelength, because the frequency numbers are too big. So just to remind you where we are, we are at typically 193 terahertz, whereas typical FM radio is 100 megahertz. Cell systems might be in the one gig to two gig range. So we're at 193 terahertz, and that tells you why optics has the capacity that it does. When you want to modulate this type of a carrier, you want to usually modulate at a fraction of the bandwidth, but this is why it's considered to be an exceptionally high information carrying capacity carrier. Okay. So, so this is, this is probably a, a, an important thing to look at, is that what is the promise, why now, and what's missing? First, as I said, it has an exceedingly large carrying capacity. And as a, as a quick note, it is at least in principle possible to put everybody on the planet on a single strand of optical fiber for a phone call. But a phone call has small bandwidth, right? It's kilohertz of bandwidth. But it's potentially possible to put everybody on the planet on one piece of glass. We don't do that because we don't use the phone anymore. It's all video. So we're really exhausting the available capacity in many places. Right. But it's scalable. Certainly it wins maybe on size and weight. Power is an issue, something to be considered. That is, how much power does it take to run these systems? Uh, electromagnetic immunity, yes. Uh, thermal effects, yes and no, have to be careful. Uh, interferometric systems, clearly interferometric capabilities would be very nice. And interoperability with si silicon CMOS. But why now? There continues to be this need for increased connectivity. It is just an unlimited demand for watching cats play ping pong. There's it's unlimited demand, and we have to supply that. With respect to numbers, the carriers must deliver 20% more bits at the same cost year on year. So imagine you're in a business, you have to deliver 20% more product and you can't raise your cost. That's where the carriers are today. All right. Commercial foundries are now available to produce the silicon photonic chips, you can design them at your desktop and have them delivered by FedEx. There are some emerging design and simulation tools. These need to be upgraded. But there's a lot of effort today with a number of companies creating large advances in full end-to-end -end design tool suites. But what's needed? Certainly integration and packaging. This continues to be a challenge, not just for the electronics piece, but also for the photonics piece. So heterogeneous integration and packaging, it depends upon how you look at it, whether you want to call it integration or packaging, it depends on what level you are. Certainly assembly and standards are not there. Um, we need these end-to-end co-design tools that can optimize your electronics together with your photonics at once. Um, validation for harsh environments, and that's, that, that's the center point question for our NSF uh, uh, center. And test and measurement. We can always use better, more enhanced test and measurement tools. All right. Some applications, interconnects, 
usually short reach, very short reach, chip to chip, board to board, rack to rack. Um, quantum computing, quantum computing and quantum communications certainly will rely on integrated photonics. Sensing, direct computing, that is high performance computing, not necessarily quantum. Digital and also analog RF. I'll give you a quick snapshot of some of these so you can get a feel for what those applications are really about. All right. So here is a slide uh, courtesy of Ted Ledovic from Global Foundries. We work very closely with Global. Um, it's showing you some of the design tools that are components that are available now from the foundry. So you can just place these into a configuration of your choosing without having to design a modulator, without having to design a photodiode, a detector, or a waveguide. So you can take a quick look. You can see modulators, both MZM, um, Mach Zender style modulators, ring modulators, photodiodes, passive waveguides of a variety of types. Um, but also with interesting on the, on the Global Foundries process, it, it is truly a monolithic hybrid system, meaning you can do electronics and photonics on the same die together. That is, a un that is a unique feature of Global Foundry's process. So these are just some of the structures that come available to you just by having access to the process design kit. Some of the integrated photonics foundries that exist today that you could interact with, and certainly my team has interacted with all of these in green, AIM Photonics, the Tower Semiconductor. Tower is uh, likely is in the process of being purchased by Intel. But you can see there's a lot of offerings now in foundry services where, again, you can design the integrated photonics at your desk and have them fabricated for you. Um, note uh, this, the delineation of the process design kit, version 1.0. So AIM is 3.5, version 1.0, version 1.121. What does that mean? It means this is brand new. It means they've just now gotten the confidence to call it a full 1.0 PDK. That's within the last number of months. Okay, some features of how you might want to qualify or quantify the level of integration. So this shows the number of components per pick, but it's the number of devices on a single waveguide, really. It's the number, of, it's not just I have a pick with 100 photodiodes, none of which are interacting. This is kind of a system's way of counting. So be careful when you see plots like this. How are you counting? Are you counting the entire wave or what are you, so this is supposedly the number of components on a system that is connected to a single set of waveguides. So a couple of things to point out here. One, that the blue line is monolithic indium phosphide. And the biggest thing to note is the slope is much different. That is, the growth of that is much, much different. And then we have both the red and the green. And the monolithic being uh, the red silicon photonics and the green being the heterogeneous, which means I have found a way to integrate three, five semiconductors which produce gain together with the silicon. So I'm trying to exploit both a three, five semiconductor material and silicon processing capability at the same time. So look, look where these are. We're rapidly approaching 10 to the fourth component. So we are nowhere near electronics, but I don't think we need to be to have a dramatic impact. Something to remember, perhaps, is the number of devices on a single device, single waveguide, is about 2.7 dB per year. So almost doubling every year, almost. All right, let's just go through a couple of quick examples now of the types of things you might see being done in industry. So first, there's co-packaging and interconnects, um, showing where we're moving from. This is moving from uh, what we're going to call generation one with pluggable optics, where the optics may be on board somewhere, to uh, onboard optics that is on the same PCB. The optics exist together with the electronics. And then where they're really co-packaged, first in a, in a 2.5D and eventually in a 3D co-packaged arrangement. And then eventually where we want to get to a place where everything is on the same die. So we're trying to get the optics together with the electronics and let the optics perform the function they do best at least, which is the transport that is moving the data on and off. At a bare minimum, I think that is where you'll see optics 
flourish. But uh, there's also advances being made where the optics will also do your signal processing. Here's an example uh, from IR Labs. And they, this is a fully um, functional transceiver. And it takes advantage of electronics and optics on the same die. And you can see how it works pretty straightforward. You start with a what's known as a comb source, which is an arrangement of different comb lines corresponding to different wavelengths, all from a single source. And you route that onto your PIC, onto your photonic integrated circuit, which has an arrangement of different resonators. And those resonators are tuned to different frequencies, different wavelengths. And each of those resonators can be modulated such that I can now impinge on each of the different colors independently separate data. But the interesting thing is I don't have an optical MUX or DMUX. I just let all the wavelengths through all at the same time, and I hope that the individual ring modulators operate exclusively on a single wavelength. And because it's a monolithic process, I have the drivers right next to the modulators. I have clock distribution, and I have all the data coming on, but all of this is comprised on a single pick. Additionally, Rings are very thermally sensitive. They're a high Q structure, and therefore they're temperature sensitive. They need to be constantly tuned to keep their resonant frequency on the target wavelength. We do that with a separate low-speed servo system, which keeps them tuned. Similarly, you can make a receiver, which does a very similar function. You can couple out specific wavelengths onto its own receiver. You also have tuning for those. And then you have your clock and data recovery. So on a single die, very small, of the order of millimeters square, you can have a complete transceiver system capable, presumably, hopefully of terabits per second on a single die. Remember, it wasn't year, too many years ago where this took up racks of equipment. Okay. Modern flows, design flow. So just to let you know how this is typically done. You might think, if you're familiar with uh, electronics design, that you start with a schematic, an electronic schematic of your transistors and how the transistors are going to create a gate or an amplifier and are going to interact with an entire large array. Or DRAM, where it's an entire memory system. We typically don't start there on a design flow with photonics. We typically start really with layout to understand. We, we kind of have an idea of what we're going to do. And then we go through a simulation uh, tool, identify the proper performance. Probably this is a, a, a cyclical event. Then design rule checks, DRC, to make sure that what you've crafted can be fabricated. And then you output a GDS file, send it off to your foundry, and hopefully that will send you silicon dye back. Okay. One thing that we have to consider is that this whole ecosystem of the PDKs, the design tools, and the packaging really has to be done in a single design flow. That is, if you think about your packaging after the fact, it's usually too late. So we're really looking forward to the place where we'll get to this ability to do everything holistically. Um, just a quick reminder, and this is from Professor Bakir. Um, who is an expert in integration, 2.5D, 3D integration, that the point here is that as our integration strategies move to 3D, that silicon photonics is intimately part of this ecosystem, that we will have silicon photonic dye that are part of this 3D heterogeneous integration. So we may have memory, we may have processors, be an electronic, but also there will likely be silicon photonics as part of this stack. All right, so let's talk about heterogeneous systems. And you'll see what, what I mean by that momentarily. So here's, I think, a, a tour de force of a laser made in silicon. The interesting thing here is this is a silicon process with indium phosphide style um, gain media, in this case quantum dots, dye bonded onto the silicon waveguides. The laser cavity is comprised of an end mirror on the gain media, but also this combination of rings, which, as you know, are resonant structures. 
What's interesting about this? That you can now make this part such so low loss that it is an integral part of the cavity. And then you can use these rings to control what wavelength is reflected. And then you can tune it. The interesting thing is that the cavity now is long. Well, what do long cavities do? The simple way to think about why lasers that, with long cavities perform with lower noise is that the cavity is longer, so it has longer memory, so to speak. That is, photons that have been gone a while come back. And that usually means that you have a tighter phase tolerance for all photons. And that usually means that the noise is better. So this is a plot of laser noise versus offset frequency from the carrier. It's uh, hertz per root hertz. It's a strange number. But take it from this as this represents a laser line width of 95 hertz. So think of what that means. The carrier frequency is 193 terahertz. But the laser frequency doesn't vary much outside of a 95 hertz window. It's extremely high Q. This is extremely stable low noise laser. You say, OK, people can make those lasers. Great. This is in silicon. So watch for silicon becoming the place to make your best performing laser, not just your, well, I needed a laser in silicon, so it's OK. OK. Analog RF. Another application. So photonic down conversion is an interesting concept where I can take an RF signal, I can modulate an optical carrier, and then I can take that optical carrier, mix it with a local oscillator, and thereby mix down to IF any portion of that optical spectrum that I want. So imagine I have a very, very wide RF spectrum, but I'm interested in looking at a small slice. So here is a very agnostic, that is wavelength agnostic system, which can grab any part of the RF system spectrum that you like. Here's an example of it. This is uh, the work of Christian Buttonfield, who's now at GTRI. Um, this is an uh, actual picture of the die, another picture. And this shows the RF signal with uh, a 5 gigahertz or so tone, the local oscillator nearby, and the mix down IF. And this is completely tunable. I can create an IF from any two LO and signal choices that I want. Or I could do this in parallel and create many IFs. Another uh, application is now this direct combination of optics and RF amplification, traveling wave amplifiers. I can take two optical signals, merge them together, and mix them in photodiodes. And we know that a photodiode is actually an electric field detector. So it's sensitive to the mixing products of the electric field of the two wavelengths. So what we'll see both the sum and difference. So you can take two lasers offset by 10 gigahertz and create a 10 gigahertz tone. So this is a, a RF source with high spectral purity. The spectral purity originates from the lasers themselves. Yet it's tunable. So I now have a high spectral purity, widely tunable RF source. And the power is made by adding these optical signals, photo, optical photocurrents, in a traveling wave amplifier design. This is a true hybrid photonic electronic system. All right, space. So this is part of our NSF, IUCRC, which is Industry University Research Collaborative Center. And just a, just a word or two to advertise our center. Um, why? Well, as you may be aware, a number of companies are working to move essentially parts of the transport part of the internet to orbit. So we're going to have lots of systems in orbit, and they will be interconnected optically. They might connect to the ground optically, like the RF and optical. So we need to understand the robustness of optics, as well as electronics, for orbital missions. So this is just a summary of, our, of EPICA, which is Electronic and Photonic Integrated Circuits for Aerospace, EPIC with an A. And this just identifies what our, what our mission is. That is to look at photonic integrated circuits and validate for harsh environments, whether it be radiation, launch conditions, temperature, and designing systems that are robust, designing components that are robust to these conditions. Right. Our mission, without reading every word, enable the use of integrated photonics, electronics, and communications and sensing for spaceborne and all aerospace applications.
Okay, so now really the heart of the matter today is to talk about what my team has fo been focusing on for a number of years now, and that is this new paradigm for designing photonics, integrated photonics. So I talked about this. What we want to do is we really want to focus on how we're going to augment this design part, how we're going to design from the ground up optimized components. So here's one challenge, and that is the fabrication variability. We all know that the foundries are very good, yet the limitations of lithography and the entire fabrication process lead to variations in the actual part that's fabricated, whether it be a transistor or a waveguide or a photodiode. There are variations. There are variations in size. Sometimes layer thicknesses vary. And this can be accounted for in this process. There are random variations that is just basically, you want to think of it as noise, just random sidewall roughness, random changes in waveguide thickness. But there are also systematic variations. It's systematically unders undersized or systematically oversized. And anyone who's fabricated their own parts in a clean room, know that this is just a natural consequence of the variation of the fabrication process. And the other challenge is how are you going to do your design? Are you going to do what we call a forward design? That is, we really rely on what we understand to be how to create that optical function. In this case, it's a splitter. And we know that we can create splitters a number of ways. We can do evanescent coupling. We can do these just splitters, which tries to take the mode, let it expand, and basically couple half the mode into one waveguide and half into the other. And then we can say, well, I kind of know this structure, and it has a couple of design variables corresponding to the radii of these shapes here. And I may have three or half a dozen design variables. And then I let, in some computational way, those design variables vary. And I find some optimum solution based upon my foundry limitations. My foundry can only make a part or something so small. That's one way. Another way is to do shape optimization. So I take my presumed, again, my presumed shape, and I slice it up into segments or geometric regions. And then I let each of these regions vary in width, and I optimize it that way. And then you can say, well, I can probably make this pretty, I can make, maybe make 100 slices here. And I can do a pretty fine job with that. But still, you've already dramatically constrained the problem. What does topology optimization do? It continuously varies all of the design field. It presumes nothing other than the design field is as large as you've allowed it to be. Other than that, it makes no a priori decisions as to what the shape, or lack of shape for that matter, is the optimum structure. So the question is, if I want to make a splitter, how do I get here? Now, I would argue that this structure, is, is, from looking at it, is not really intuitive. You wouldn't sketch that and say, this isn't going to be my best design. Okay. So this is known as inverse design. What we're going to do is, we're going to put some constraints on the outputs and let a machine learning-like tool identify what is the proper shape. So here's what we've been doing. And some of the students here are really at the forefront of this technology. Is we've developed this, what we're calling a unified framework for density-based topology optimization. Topology optimization, or TO, is a subset of inverse design. It's a specific type of inverse design. In this case, it's the topology. It is the shape of the system which defines your function. So for example, this is a grading coupler. You might expect it to have just a lot of straight lines. It doesn't. This is a 90 degree hybrid, and I'll say a little more about that. But what we can also do in this design process is we can add constraints. A priori, we can make the constraints that it must fulfill the PDK design rule constraints. It must have the outputs from the splitter be equal. It must have them be equal over a wide wavelength range. 
You can add those constraints yourself. Okay, so let me give you some feel for how it works. So the first is we're going to start with some blank canvas, which is just a random assortment of pixels, and this represents your design field. And you can choose. It usually it's the number of microns, 5, 10 microns on edge, 20 microns on edge perhaps. But you, don't make no you make no statements about what's inside. And the first thing you do is you filter the variables to enforce design rule constraints. That is, you filter the, the sort of the primitive shapes to make sure they're not too small or too big. And then you do what we call a Maxwell solve. Even before you have anything, you just start with a random assortment of pixels. And there may be you know, 10 to the fifth pixels in this space. You start with a random assortment, and you do a forward design. And you ask, well, I'm going to launch a wave here. I'm going to use a Maxwell solver and figure out what comes out the two outputs. And of course, to start with, it's nothing of importance. The next step is to do what's called the backwards solve, or an adjoint simulation. So you effectively illuminate the outputs and record what comes out the input. So all of this is based on rigorous linear algebra, which has been known for a long time, but it's only been made available relatively recently due to the computational powers required. So this is a topology, an example of topology optimization for photonics, but you can see it being applied to other things, structures, bridges, buildings. Okay, so what does this buy you when this happens? Well, oh, that's not what I want just yet. What does it buy you? When you do the forward and backward, you can compare the two cases, and that will give you the information on the gradient to the next best solution. It doesn't give you the solution directly, but it tells you how to adjust this design field to the next best solution. So it's an iterative step. So you go around this multiple times and eventually arrive at your optimized solution. So in this case, this is a splitter starting with essentially unknown. This is a few steps in to the final thing. Now, there's some challenges along the way. And you can add the design rules of your choice. So here's another splitter. Note, this, is, this splitter actually does two things. And that's one of the choices the designer has to make. Do I make a splitter, like we saw in the previous slide? Or do I make a splitter and a 90 degree bend, which this is? It does both functions. So how many functions you try to wrap up into a single design field is a, is a choice you have to make. So let's see what this does. So here's the gray random structure. And then what does it do? It just starts randomly. This shows the split ratio versus wavelength. And this shows the split ratio versus iteration. So you see it very quickly gets to a 50% splitter. But you also notice that the design field is not either white or black corresponding to that's where I have silicon and that's where I don't have silicon. It's gray. And it's done that way because it's much easier to compute gradients, derivatives, when I have a continuum field. But at some point here, you have to binarize the whole thing and say, look, there's no such thing as half air and half silicon. I've got to either choose one or the other. So you get to some design point, and then you make it either yes, there's silicon, or no, there's not. Well, of course, that results in a worse performance, but you anticipate that you've let this run long enough to where you're, some, you're near some global optimum. So now if you make it binary, all you need to do is march back to some new optimum solution. So this is now an optimum structure for a splitter. Again, I argue this is non-intuitive. So I have to admit, when we first taped these out and had the silicon come back, we were like, this better work, right? It's, it's, these are very strange looking structures, but they work beautifully. Right? And you can see that they work by looking at, I think this should work. You, at the, of course, at the end, you go back and test using the Maxwell solver and see, is it really doing what I think? And so the answer is yes, it does. And yes, do these extra structures pr produce some? You can look carefully and see there is electric field or energy at the periphery. So each of these extended structures are also performing a function. Of course, the other, other questions are going to be, you know, would it perform better if I made it bigger? Would it perform just as good if I made it smaller? 
So these are some of the other things that the designer has to sort of explore at the beginning to come up with an optimum design size. Okay. So here's an example of robust optimization. So what we did here is we added the, con the further constraint that it has to work just as well if it's over etched or under etched. And ask, does that extra constraint make it perform overall worse, although good enough over the, over the entire range? And as you can see, that what we call the non-robust design with these orange, uh, I'm sorry, the non-robust with the blue, and then the robust, that is, it should be insensitive to over under etch, there's no real penalty. There's no penalty for asking it to perform just as well if it's somewhat over or under etched. Now, to be fair, these are dramatically over or under etched, much more so than the foundry can do. It's meant to be a, a very, very robust challenge to the optimization process. And again, this, this works. Um, this is the splitting ratio, um, and this represents the over and under etched region. So this works actually extremely nice when you add the constraints properly. The other thing that we add are foundry DRC design rule constraints. That is, it can't, the line width violations and line space can only be so small. It's a, typically called the resolution, but it's given by a line space number. There are both area and enclosed area violations that it can't make an island that's too small and it can't make an opening that's too small. And that number, those numbers are different than the line space numbers. So we've added those right, to make sure that all of the features meet these DRC constraints. That's done from the very beginning. Okay. Here's an example of a splitter. This is a what I'll call a forward splitter. It doesn't include the 90 degree bend. And you can see how this is a picture of our uh, fiber array above the pick. And this shows the measured performance versus wavelength and the split ratio. It's a pretty fine line, 45 to 55%. It performs extremely well in the design region. Much over, much larger than typically required, which would be over the telecom C band, which is 1530 nanometers to about 1565. So it's extremely well performing over a very wide range. We also spent some care designing the test circuits. You want to make sure that you're measuring the split ratio and not some differential loss in a waveguide or some other feature. You don't want to be measuring the I-O coupling variation. So some care was made to make multiple splits in either one split, two splits, eight splits. And that way, you can project a plot and identify what, in fact, is the loss and what is the average split ratio of your splitter. So you have to think about how you're going to test these structures before you lay out your final design. Here's another example. This is an inverse design grading coupler. Um, it, this briefly shows the design uh, uh, evolution from essentially noise to the structure. In this case, we looked at designing, uh, taking advantage of two layers of the process, the polysilicon layer and the silicon layer. So this shows the iteration, eventually reaching a coupling efficiency of about uh, 3 dB. But the interesting feature here is this, now, this device now does two things. Not only does it couple light into waveguides, but it splits the incoming polarization, one pole into one waveguide and one into the other. And you can look at this structure, and at first glance, you might say that there's nothing discernible functional there, but there really is. If you look carefully, you really see our two intersecting interferometric structures. We can also design it specifically with the idea of coupling to a fiber. That is, we can use an approach where if this is the top of the pick, we can project the propagation of the light from the surface to the location of the presumed fiber and thereby match the mode shape at the fiber face to the mode shape of the fiber itself. So you can design all of that in and to make sure your structure produces the, the field at the distance the fiber is expected to be. And this shows that structure um, for both the single pole device and the dual pole device. 
Here's a picture from, uh, of the Global Foundries pick. And you can see, if you look carefully, this is taken here in, in Marcus with the visible, high-res visible microscope we have here. And no, yes, these structures are very small, sub-micron, but even with visible light, you can just make out the structure. And you're really looking through silicon dioxide on top. It's essentially glass you're looking through on the very top. So you can see right through down to the layers. This is the single pole, and this is the dual pole with the two waveguides coming out. Some measurements, insertion loss. So we can see insertion loss. In this first design, the simulation was here with a few dB, 6 dB of insertion loss, and this is the measurement. And I'll say a few words about this offset in a minute. We think we understand the behaviors here. And then this is the return loss. That is, you can also constrain the reflection to be minimum. So if you're familiar with S parameters for RF, this is a scattering parameter, so S11. That is, you want to minimize the light reflected back into wherever your source was, which is often a good thing to do. So you can, you can, constrain, you can add that constraint to your system. So we add, we measure the return loss. In this case, it's more than 15 dB. And this is for the dual, this is for the dual pole structure. And this is the polarization extinction, extremely good extinction between two polarizations in excess of uh, 35 dB generally, and polarization dependent loss also very, very good. So let's see if we have here. So one, one thing uh, we're learning is that the, the, what's actually fabbed when we're doing these kind of freestyle designs, right? these are not obviously not designs that Global Foundries made. These are our own, that some of the peculiarities of the fabrication process, which only reveal themselves when we do what we're doing, Namely, we're designing on two layers that you have to worry, we believe, on planarization. This is a lower layer fully planar with respect to the next layer on top. And we think that's part of the reason why the, the measure is slightly different from the design. But we have ways around that when we're working on a second design now. This is the 90 degree hybrid. Uh, a 90 degree hybrid, each output port produces the mixing product between two inputs with 90 degree phase offsets. Very conventional, very, very useful device. Useful in coherent receivers and useful in well, what we call Stokes receivers. We made this a 5x5 five five micron structure, and this is the, a snapshot of the Maxwell solver showing when I have fa input phase differences between two uh, an input, say, and, and a local oscillator, this shows where the power goes. This is a way of really inspecting your input signal and identifying essentially the orthogonal polarization, not polarization, but field states, carrier phase states, and why do you have four outputs? So that way you can have essentially 0 and 180 and 90 and 270, which is a very, there's, there's, if you're familiar with an RF hybrid, this performs the same function. So again, you have to be careful with your test structure to make sure you're testing what you think you've designed. So some efforts were made to measure phase with a purposeful path delay to provide some additional interference and uh, a separate structure for measuring power. So from these two structures, we can extract the phase behavior and the insertion loss and other figures of merit that we like to know about the structure. We do that, here's the interferometric measurement Here's filtering that, and then from the filtered measurement, you can extract the phase of these different responses. And from that phase, you can imply what the performance of the individual output ports are. And it's actually pretty good. Some offsets, again, due to this multi-layer design issue. This is a Stokes receiver, which builds off, again, the 90-degree hybrid. A Stokes receiver maps your input signals to the Poincaré sphere which tells you everything there is to know about the electric field. It tells you what the polarization is, and in principle tells you what the amplitude is, tells you about what the relative phase is, tells you the total electric field state. The nice thing about this is it's not, it's not a coherent receiver. It doesn't require a local oscillator. And so that you can deduce all of the states of polarization of the incoming field essentially with this simpler, dev simpler device. Um, of course, if we're doing photonics, we have receivers, and we also have to do the electronic design as well. So we've designed and fabricated a 
40 gigahertz plus transimpedance amplifier. So we also are doing the conventional, we'll call it mostly conventional, electronics design. The electronics that touch the photonics. So we're doing that as well, and since we are working with the Global Foundries process, this is, as I said, a monolithic process. Right. And so we can make a full coherent transceiver. Uh, we can also make specialized fiber attach connections. This is a multi-core connection. So this is a specialty fiber from OFS, where there are four cores in a single glass fiber. So the cores are very close. This is part of what the telecommunication industry calls spatially division multiplexed. That is, I have four cores, but it's really, I treat it as one fiber. So for the cost of putting it in one fiber, I have four channels, four discrete channels. But we like it because we've, we have a way, we've designed gratings, in this case, four grating couplers corresponding to the pitch of the fiber. And of course, with this, you have to design it just that the fiber is normal can't do this at an angle, which is convention for a fiber attach. But we like this because it may provide interferometric links between remote systems. Why? I could perhaps transmit a local oscillator on one, one core and a signal on another core. And because they traverse the same environment, they are likely to arrive at the receive side with a very similar relative phase. And we think the difference can be managed dynamically. So this is a way of avoiding, imagine if you have two separate fibers, you're not going to have any reliable relative phase between the two signals. So this is a long-term goal of interconnecting photonic dye, remote photonic dye, in an inter interferometric way over fiber. Um, when we say silicon photonics, we also imply silicon nitride. So it's not just pure silicon. It's sometimes silicon nitride. So the nitrides have some nice features. Namely, the band gap is much larger. They can handle more power. So we're also designing structures. This is a taper in a silicon nitride waveguide, and we've begun work on doing these tapers, still maintaining the fundamental mode. You say, well, why do you want to go to a wider waveguide? If you go to a wider waveguide, you have a number, perhaps a number of advantages. Namely, the field strength at the edges where there's roughness is lower, and so scattering loss will be reduced if you can maintain the field in its lowest mode. Okay, so let me end here. How much time do I have? Uh, five, ten minutes. Okay, so just a couple of words now on machine learning. So I'm going to take a little bit of a leap here to talk about some related things we're doing, which are what you might consider more traditional machine learning strategies. So this is machine learning for photonics, photonic systems. So the way we look at this is this depicts uh, kind of your generic network with routers and digital coherent receivers. This might expand over a campus or over a state. But the idea is I have digital coherent receivers distributed throughout my network. And the way to think about this is the users of these systems are interested in providing ones and zeros bits for the end user, because that's what they pay for. The way we think about this is that DCR is test equipment. It's an electric field device that can tell you other things besides just is that a one or a zero. And so we think of this as test equipment that we can extract other information about the network. Uh, this is a depiction of the demodulation process in a modern coherent system that is Think of this as performing the function of your FM radio, which has to identify what is the difference between the current local oscillator and the incoming signal. It has to find a way of locking that on so that the local oscillator locks on to the carrier. In the case of optics, it also has to deal with two polarization states and figure out which one is which. It has to do equalization. In the case of fiber systems, it has to do chromatic dispersion. All of these functions now in a modern photonic system are done in DSP. They're not done in hardware. So we look at these and we ask ourselves, what can additional can we learn here that's not necessarily delivering ones and zeros, but telling me something about the health of the network? So this is just some machine learning efforts that we've done, uh, different techniques. What, what, is the, what is the input we're looking at? Filter weights the carrier phase recovery behavior, the raw waveform itself, the constellation diagram. 
uh, Stokes based depictions of it or just the plain signal spectra. And we've used different machine learning techniques and we've looked at deducing something about the health of the network. Some fault detection, modulation format, essentially telling the end user something about the behavior of the signal or the network in general. Um, here's an example of two places we looked. One early on in the demodulation code, right after timing recovery. We've looked here, and we've also looked at the very, very end. And we've looked at what features of the signal are visible at these different places in the demodulation. You might imagine that one of the goals of the demodulation is to cover up imperfections in the waveform that occur over the network. So you might ask, where is the optimum place to look to tell me something about the health of the fiber system? Well, we did that, and just, I know this looks very, very busy, but what it really is is measuring the optical signal-to-noise ratio through some machine learning technique. So it's a very strange request. Usually machine learning wants to classify something as it's, it's a cat or a dog. Here what we're trying to say is tell me, throw away all the signal features and tell me about the noise. So it's actually a challenging step. But this tells the absolute error, and it's on a log plot. So if, any, if we're anywhere near being you know, a fraction of a dB off of the optical signal-to-noise ratio, you're doing very, very good. And it's done for a wide range of optical signal-to-noise ratios that you typically encounter on a fiber system. And it works for a QPSK format all the way up to a 32 QAM format. It works extremely well. This will be, my, I think, my last depiction of what I want to give you an idea of what machine learning can do for photonics. And what, is, what we're really looking at here is as these systems begin to merge between electronics and photonics and DSP, when all of that comes together, it gets harder and harder to figure out where the issues are. How do I disentangle what the photonics are doing, what electronics are doing, what the DSP is covering up? How do I learn about my composite system when I can only look at inputs and outputs? So we tackle this problem which is known as TDEC-Q, which is a strange name, but it's trans transmitter dispersion eye closure penalty. And we, don't, we no longer measure the eye diagrams directly. We, we really don't even measure bit error rates anymore. It's too hard and too slow. So what we do is we, we measure this metric called the TDEC-Q. And we have to do it this way because the receiver is smart. The receiver has dynamic signal processing going on. And yet your question is, is my transmitter functional? Meaning, does it meet some standard? It's a very challenging question. So here's what the IEEE approved process is for doing that measurement. It's a multi-nested, non-linear process. It looks at the output of the transmitter, looks at the optics. It performs. I won't go through all this, filtering, sampling, timing recovery, tries to synchronize, tries to synchronize. But then it goes through this loop where it adds noise and constantly adjusts the DSP equalization. And then it asks, is it good enough? No. And it goes back, readjusts weights, adjusts, makes more measurements. This is all done in MATLAB or some C code. But even when it's optimized, it still takes a long time to go through this IEEE process to finally come out with a TDEQ, which is really a measurement of the eye closure penalty versus some ideal system. And then it will tell you, does your eye, does it qualify? So using machine learning, we trained this type of system, and we simplified it to this. Essentially what you're doing is you're mapping from a waveform shape to a number. So this tells you the power of machine learning and when to use it. So you use machine learning in this example, not because you don't have a good prescriptive algorithm, but because it takes too long. It's too computationally intensive. So we make this nonlinear map using convolutional neural networks, CNNs, to do this mapping for us. And it's, as you might imagine, this is instantaneous. Right? This is in the millisecond range. But once you get less than a second, it, it probably matters more how long it takes to connect up your part. But the interesting thing is that when properly done, machine learning can tell you a lot about these integrated systems of electronics, photonics, and DSP. All right. Here's the results of that. 
This is the measured TDEC cube by the traditional IEEE method, and this is the measured one by our machine learning method. And it can't be perfect because it's a statistical process. If you measured it over and over using the IEEE method, you're going to get a slightly different answer. And this just shows the, the, the accuracy versus the TDEC Q threshold. So it's really very good when the, when the TDEC Q, this is bad, that is the deviation from the ideal is larger. But this worked very, very well, and we licensed this to a, a sponsor. All right, so let me, let me just jump really to our, our learning here, that machine learning is really problem specific, and what that really means is domain knowledge is essential for machine learning, for creating good machine learning tools. Um, uh, first, you need to define your success, identify key variables, and really what you're doing is regression to highly nonlinear problem. But these are kind of the learning takeaways from this, from our adventures in machine learning and photonics. All right. Key challenges, end-to-end uh, -end simulations and assessments. Separating the physics from the DSP is a big challenge. Um, many... Oh, well, I can just jump to the final thoughts. So let me just end here. So first of all, integrated photonics is clearly a disruptive technology. It requires a shift in the way we design and test. It exploits all the degrees of freedoms. It doesn't have any op much a priori knowledge about the requirements. Uh, the machine learning and AI piece is disruptive as well, but it can accelerate design, deployment, and validation. That last step I showed you was validation. In integrated photonics, loss is everything. What does that mean? Think about the way an electronic VLSI circuit works. It's digital, and every time the signal goes through a gate, that gate is a nonlinear gate, and it regenerates the signal effectively every time it goes through a gate. If the signal comes in noisy as input to the gate, it comes out with the same SNR that the system can produce. In photonics, we don't yet have a nonlinear gate. So as the signal progresses through the pick, it's losing photons. That means it's losing SNR. Lasers fabricated within silicon photonics may be better than native lasers on purely indium phosphide or gallium arsenide substrates. Photonics invariably includes electronics. If you think it's us versus them, it's the photonics folks versus the electronics folks, you've lost already. It's never that way. It's how do you optimize these systems together. Packaging is difficult. It's an enormous field. A number of folks here were working on it. Professor Bakir is working on it. Clearly, a lot of folks associated with IEN are working these, these challenges. And that certainly a well-trained photonics workforce is just not there. There are a lot of opportunities for being in, I won't call it the basement level. I said a photonics is not new. Integrated photonics is not new. But it's an, ex it's an explosive area still. So let me leave it there. If you're interested in any of these things in more detail, any of these topics that I touched on can have its own hour talk easily. But I'm just trying to cut across the top for you. Okay. All right, thank you. All right. So I think we have time for maybe one or two questions. When you're doing the topology optimization across the different iterations going from just the gray block to a defined photonic structure, um, when you're using mach the machine learning algorithm, have you found certain parameters that are most dominant in improving your signal to noise ratio? Oh, we we're gonna ask Arjun. Arjun, this is where the art comes in. So Arjun is an expert in what impacts and how the end user, how the user of the tool homes in on what matters. Did I choose the right size? Do I have the right constraints? Am I over constrained? Or Arjun, what, what can you say about what the user learns, the artistry of using the tools? Yeah, I mean, it varies a lot from design to design. It, it's really problem dependent, but probably the, the first thing that you adjust when you start your simulation and it doesn't work right is, the binarization factor, like when, when those constraints kick in and how, how strongly they're impacting throughout the optimization, the size and distribution of waveguides in the design region, things like that. Yeah. That, that turning point of when to do the binarization is a big step. Okay. 
So my question is about the aging of devices. For example, if there are like ring resonators that need to be tuned at specific temperature, will uh, this be a important factor that affect long time, uh, like lifetime of the device? And is there any study on that? Yeah. So let me let me answer that two ways. First, I'll answer the question you didn't ask, and then I'll answer the question you asked. So the first the, the question that came to mind is. Um, what can we do to minimize the tuning? And one thing that we're working on is adding temperature constraints to the design. That is, trying to make it inherently temperature insensitive. So we can do that. The question is, how broad a solution space is there? So we'll try to minimize the amount of heating and just to minimize that constant process and thereby maybe make the device let live longer. The second one is, how long can I keep heating this device maybe maybe heated a lot, heated a little, constantly, every day, 24 hours a day. That's a bigger question as to the robustness. And that's, I, that problem is probably best tackled by the foundry. Uh, one thing they're doing is they're changing their heating systems, their heaters, in order to make them more efficient. That is to deposit the heat, the thermal energy, only where it's needed and not elsewhere, and therefore make it more robust. Not only more power efficient, but more robust. So they are working on methods to make them have a, a longer, you know, end of life kind of behavior. There's those, but I think a lot of that is foundry, foundry problems. Let's thank uh, Professor Ralph one more time, and we'll see you in January. Thank Thanks, David.